Friends, a few nights ago, I gave a, a overview um, of uh, a series of talks that I uh, thought I would be doing on Afghanistan. And uh, tonight uh, is going to be the first of those uh, talks. Um, I had outlined, I think it was about 15 points that I wanted to address, uh, perhaps in as many talks. Um, and what I would like to do is to begin with the first of those points. Uh, these are not necessarily in the order in which they had been mentioned uh, the other day, but uh, whatever uh, subject really strikes me as something that I'm prepared to talk on at the moment, uh, because uh, I'd like to reflect on all of these matters before I speak on them. And so what I want to talk about today is the whole question of the rights of women and girls. I had suggested in my remarks a few nights ago, when I gave a brief overview uh, of each of these points, that with respect to the question of women and girls, this is in fact the principal justification that the US has really offered for its 20 year occupation of Afghanistan. Now, of course, this is a kind of a veil because we know that the United States went into Afghanistan in 2001 following the September 19 bombings, uh, and the United States was determined to draw blood. It was, it was, it was thirsty for revenge uh, after the killing uh, of several thousand Americans in the bombings uh, at the World Trade Center, uh, World Trade Center uh, and of course, some at, some at the Pentagon uh, as well. Right? So some of you might say, well, no, the real justification was to actually you know, find Osama bin Laden um, and we know that Osama bin Laden, and I think the American American intelligence knew that 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 you know within a year or so he had managed to escape uh, Afghanistan, uh, and uh, his whereabouts were unknown. And then, of course, it was around May 2000, 2011, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, when Osama bin Laden was finally uh, cornered. Uh, and killed in a special forces uh, operation, American special forces operation um, um, in what can only be described as cold blood, right? But this is not a talk on what the American special forces did, whether that was the right way to eliminate an enemy, uh, whether he should have been brought in, uh, whatever happened to due process under law, all of that, uh, we can leave that aside for the moment. The point here simply is that this uh, justification that uh, we are actually, by the Americans, that we are in Afghanistan to ensure that Afghanistan is not going to be used as a base for further terrorist actions against the United States uh, or against American interests elsewhere in the world. Uh, I'm not saying that this was not a justification uh, at all, but I'm saying that in fact, there is a very long history, as Gayatri Spivak put it, of a certain kind of discourse. And that discourse is the discourse of white men saving brown women from brown men, right? So let us go back to that. Let's go back to that. Um, but I also want to address the whole question very briefly off the history of women's education, women's rights in Afghanistan. Many of you will be surprised at something I'm going to say, just to give you a little taste of what uh, you might expect. So when did women get the vote, right to vote in the United Kingdom in 1918? When did they get it in the United States in 1920? And when did women get the right to vote in Afghanistan? 1919, right? They did get it a year before women got the right to vote in the United States. Now, what does that really tell us? That's something that we'll have to think about. But I think that one of the things that um, we also have to think about is that there are a number of assumptions made by 
all the parties, it seems to me, involved in these debates. So for example, one of the ways in which you measure whether women have become modern in a country, according to a certain line of thinking is, well, can they wear skirts or not? And if so, how short can these skirts be? Right? And I don't think, incidentally, that, uh, that this is really the way to think about these matters. It's very interesting that there are a large number of websites which show what Kabul was like in the 1960s. And in the 1960s, where women were, in fact, actually able to walk around the streets of Kabul in skirts. Right? And they were not being whipped because they had dared to show a piece of their skin, which is what was going to happen under the, the Taliban. Now, if one makes that comparison, then it's unquestionably the case that something really deteriorated in the course of, let's say, 25, 30 years. But what I would also like to suggest is that we should not assume that this is, in fact, actually a legitimate way to think about women and where they belong in a society, what kind of respect, what kind of dignity they get. Right? But let me move to the first set of questions that I started with. And that is this particular discourse that I said that I said has a long history, and that is a discourse of the white man saving brown women from brown men. Now, how do we evaluate one civilization against another civilization? I want to argue that that is the fundamental question behind this interest in women's rights. And I'll explain what I mean by that. See, if you read Joseph Conrad, a major novelist of the English language, and he has a very famous short novel called Heart of Darkness. This novel has been discussed endlessly by post-colonial theorists. It's one of their favorite novels to discuss. And there is a passage there where he talks about how, you know, you judged a man by the shape of his nose. So the Europeans said that, well, you know, black people, they have, they're snub nosed. You know, they don't have the kind of sharp features to their nose that the white man has, which were viewed as superior features, right? Now, of course, uh, physical anthropology, which was very prominent circa 1900, and incidentally is still taught in some American university departments, not very many, but physical anthropology was uh, a field uh, which around 1900, which along with such things as craniometry, craniometry is measuring the size of your, of your skull. And it was argued that you, that you could actually place people in a hierarchy of inferiority to superiority depending on the size of their skull. There was also something called the nasal index, nasal index, right? Developed by Her Herbert Risley. Herbert Risley was a British official who spent many, many years in India. He was a census commissioner of India. He was also an ethnographer, wrote voluminously. And he had this really absurd, preposterous, comical idea that you actually could place people along a hierarchy, a scale, by measuring the distance from their belly button or their navel to their nose. That's called the nasal index, to simplify it. Right? See, what's happening here is that in the period of colonialism, Europeans, of course, assumed that they were superior. So how, the question is, how do you establish your superiority over those whom you have conquered? How do you demonstrate it? And by demonstration, I don't mean by demonstrating by, by massacring them, you know, uh, obviously by, by dominating them, but are there 
forms of measurement, scales of evaluation that one can use. Now, what I've given you here are scales of evaluation, the nasal index, craniometry, right? physical anthropology. But there was also this feeling that these are kind of crude scales of measurement. And by the early 19th century, there were a number of Europeans who were beginning to think that we were going to place civilizations along a scale by looking at how these civilizations or cultures treated their women. That is one of the reasons why the English became obsessed with the whole phenomenon of sati. I have elsewhere offered lengthy lectures on sati, and those are available on my YouTube channel, as some of you may be aware. So I won't discuss that phenomenon here. But sati was the, the, the practice of widow immolation not widespread by any stretch of the imagination in India. I mean, in most years, let's say 1810, 1815, 1820, that period before its abolition in 1829, you're talking about 500, 600, 800, 1,000 cases that were documented annually by the British. Right? They got fixated on this because see for every other form of oppression that you had in India of women, there was an analog to that back in England and Europe itself. So if you said, for example, that, ah, look at these people in India, they don't allow their girls to be educated. Well, the fact of the matter is that girls were not educated in most of England either in the early 19th century or even in the mid 19th century. Women were, not, and, and certainly in higher education, women were not permitted into universities. Let's not forget that even in the United States, uh, you had girls colleges, which are created of a handful of them initially, but virtually all institutions were only open to men. Right? So if one used that as a evaluative scale, that they don't allow their girls to be educated. Remember that this is what is being argued about the Taliban today, right? The newspaper headlines have been screaming that, ah, one of the principal consequences of the reemergence of the Taliban is that women and girls are going to have to go into hiding, that women will no longer be able to work. They won't be able to show their faces really in the public unless they're accompanied by male guardians. In fact, women cannot leave the home without the permission of a male guardian, right? That's what we're being told, right? And they will be, girls will be pulled out of schools, right? So the whole matter of schooling, I'm saying, if you go back to the 19th century, now the British say, ah, Girls are not being educated in India. That shows how degraded this civilization is. Well, the problem is that girls are not being educated in England itself, by and large. So this is why they become obsessed with sati, because for sati, they do not find an equivalent. And they, sh they can say that sati demonstrates how degraded the Indians are. See, it's an evaluative scale. Uh, today, we have different kinds of evaluative skills. So the United Nations Development Program publishes an annual report. And they used, they use indices such as when they're saying, okay, which is which are the 10 countries that are the countries that are most responsive to human needs, which are the most developed, right? And then you keep on going down the list. How do, we, how do we assess that? It's not simply GDP. It is what percentage of the population in that country is educated. What is a female literacy rate? What is a male literacy rate? What is an infant mortality rate? What is a maternal mortality rate? How many hospital beds are there for every 100,000 people in the population? 
etc. I think my point should be clear. These are evaluative scales. And the UNDP actually ranks the countries the, from one to 200, or whatever the exact number of countries is. The treatment of women became, I am saying in the 19th century, the principal evaluative scale. And this remained for the course of the 19th century in India, the principal way in which the British were able to persuade Indians that you are in fact actually vastly inferior to us. Everyone should be aware that the principal arguments in the 19th century about reforming Indian society had to do with reforms associated largely with the lives of women. Can, wi women, can widows remarry? Does a society permit its widows to remarry? What percentage of girls have access to education? Are girls forced to marry at puberty? There were debates around all these issues. Right? This should explain to us, suggest to us why it is that this issue is really at the heart of the present Western discourse on the rights of women and girls. Right? And in saying this, I'm not suggesting that they don't have any intrinsic interest that this is pure hypocrisy. I'm not suggesting that it's necessarily pure hi hypocrisy, but it, there is no question at the same time that this evaluative scale can be instrumentalized to show that this civilization is a degraded civilization and vastly superior to us. And that is one reason why we're in Afghanistan. All right. So that's one set of issues. Now I want to briefly address the whole question of women's rights, their progress in the 20th century, their education in Afghanistan. Right? Now, I mentioned that women got the right to vote in 1919. This was during the time of King Amandullah Khan. It was also during his time that a family law code was passed, which banned child marriage. A constitution, a new constitution was created. This was around 1924, which abolished slavery, in principle actually granted equal rights to men and women, had a provision for a legislature, and indeed for secular education. A secular education is important because remember that, that the Taliban have argued that they are simply following the Sharia. They're following the Sharia and the Sharia, Im, Im, Sharia imposes certain kinds of requirements and women and girls will be allowed to advance so long as this is in conformity to the requirements imposed by the Sharia. And so that's why I mentioned the secular education. Now, the first school, for, first school for girls was actually opened in 1921. It's called mas, uh, Masturat, which means the covered ones. In 1923, women, we are told, and I will parse this just a little bit, are told had freedom of choice in marriage. Now, what does that really mean? It doesn't really mean that, that women could just marry anyone of their choice. Because I think in large parts of the world, not just in Afghanistan, but certainly in South Asia and even in the West, women really seldom had that kind of freedom. And getting the consent of your parents was of course critical in almost every society at that point in time. I mean, even in the United States, I mean, it was quite common that, you know, that if a man, for example, wanted to propose to a woman, he had to first actually approach the parents and, and, to the, and approach the father in particular. 
uh, and, place a, and place a proposal before them, right? So when I read, for example, you know, in uh, a brief issued, uh, a brief history of women's rights in Afghanistan um, uh, produced by a Canadian uh, Afghanistan women's group that women had the freedom of choice and marriage uh, in 1923, I think that that's actually somewhat misleading. What it actually meant as this particular document is going to point out, uh, although this is not the in way it's initially presented is that in 1923, a woman was no longer required to marry when she had her first period, her first menstrual period. Right? Apparently she was required to. I'm, I'm looking into this matter a bit more because I have also heard that this requirement was reimposed by the Taliban when they came into power in 1996. Right? So the first, first uh, uh, period of Taliban rule was 1996 to 2001. And of course, in 2001, the United States uh, um, you know, launched a war um, in Afghanistan uh, and did, crushed the Taliban in a very short period of time. Um, um, and now, of course, the Taliban have reemerged. Uh, but apparently, this, this idea that a woman was going to have to marry by the time she had her first menstrual period, uh, whether this requirement was reimposed uh, by the Taliban in 1996 is not entirely clear to me. In 1928, uh, Afghan women left to be educated uh, in Turkey. So this is the first time that Afghan women actually went overseas for educational purposes. Um, and through the 1930s and 40s and 50s, the number of girls in schools continue to increase very substantially. Um, it is estimated that as much as 30 to 35% of girls were being educated uh, through the end of the 1950s. All right. In 1963, women graduated for the first time from the medical and law faculties at the University of Kabul. Uh, and in 1966 to 71, there are at least 14 women who are going to be appointed judges um, or, uh, to courts of Islamic jurisprudence, right? 8% uh, of, in the 1960s, early 1960s, 8% of the female population was actually working, um, largely in the urban areas. But again, I think that we'd have to, we'd have to parse this figure a bit more because the number of women who are actually working is who are in the labor force is substantially larger. It's just that they're not part of the organized labor force, so to speak. Right? So, they're not, so their labor is not counted. Uh, just as feminists have argued that the labor of women at home is almost never counted. Uh, and it's certainly not counted towards the GDP, of course, uh, domestic labor, including cooking, you know, cleaning the house, taking care of the children, doing the laundry. Right? It's, it's that kind of argument, because if you're tending to goats, for example, if a woman is tending to, to goats, uh, if her husband has a flock of goats or sheep, right? or, or let's say it takes care of camel or is a camel driver and the woman actually helps to take care of the camels, uh, is she being counted in the 8%? of the women who are supposed to be part of the labor force. And I would say, no, that 8% figure doesn't include that, all right? So it's worthwhile to keep that in mind. Now, I think the, to, to look further at this particular history, uh, what's going to happen, let's just going back for a moment, Amalul Lakhan is, because this is not a history of seamless progress, right? Um, uh, in the manner in which I presented it thus far, because there are going to be setbacks in between. The reason there are going to be setbacks, for example, is in 1929, uh, Amanullah Khan is going to be actually deposed. There's going to be a, a coup, uh, and um, uh, the person who succeeds him, uh, Habibullah uh, Kalakani, uh, he is going to impose the Sharia uh, 
Okay, he's going to impose the Sharia. Uh, the right to vote that women had is going to be taken away. Uh, and in fact, actually, uh, the right even of certain men is going to be taken away because if you were under the age of 40, you couldn't really vote. And effectively, it's not going to be until about 1963, 64 that women are going to be able to vote again. All right. So there are setbacks. So while women, so what we're seeing is that while women, in fact, actually are being educated uh, in this period of time, uh, at the same time, certain other privileges and entitlements are being stripped from them. All right. So um, the question now, the, the last set of questions really that I want to look at uh, over here is uh, what happens under the Taliban? Right, so 1996, 2001 uh, is a period that has been described as a period of atrocities against women and girls. Atrocities against a large part of the population, at least in the conventional accounts that we have seen. I think that we're going to have to, in a subsequent talk, when I talk about how is it that the Taliban were able to come back we're going to have to rethink this matter because it's not possible for the Taliban to have really come back unless they had some kind of support in the rural countryside. Now, if they had that support in the rural countryside and if they had behaved brutally towards every constituency in the rural countryside, there would be deep, bitter memories of that as well. Right? So there's some reason to question to what extent the brutality is extended across all constituencies. Right? In saying this, I am not in any way minimizing the stories of atrocities committed against women and girls. But there are also other considerations when we think about some of these atrocities. Um, I recall very clearly, and then in preparing for this talk, I decided to revisit my memory on this question, but I remember very clearly reading many years ago. Um, this is when this is when uh, uh, this is not during the period when the Taliban were in power, but this is uh, during the period of the American occupation uh, and during the presidency of uh, Karzai, uh, uh, not during the presidency of Ashraf Ghani, but during I think the presidency of Karzai. Uh, I remember reading about. Uh, what had happened to a 19-year-old girl called Ruxana, uh, who was actually stoned to death. There was a video that was taken uh, and it was circulated. Um, uh, she had been accused of adultery. Uh, she was married against her will and eloped with a 23-year-old man called Mohammed Gul. They were captured eventually. He was given 100 okay, uh, strokes of the whip and let go. But she was stoned to death. And it's a horrific video. A really horrific video because, you know, I don't know how many of you are aware of how this is done, but the person who's being stoned to death is buried with just the head uh, you know, uh, over the or the ground, and then and then one by one, people come and they just throw stones. Right now, this was laid at the door of the Taliban, but this is where the matter is tricky because subsequent investigations revealed that the stoning was carried out by local religious leaders. There were some Taliban present. There were also armed landlords who were present. This happened actually in the village of. Uh, Galmin, uh, a village uh, which is on the outskirts of Feroz Ko, uh, and this is in the Ghor province. Uh, when the Ghor province, for those of you who are uh, aware of Indian history, this is the same province associated with the name of Muhammad of Ghori, uh, uh, one of the one of the um, uh, Muslim invaders um, uh, in the 12th century, right? Uh, very notorious figure, at least in Indian eyes, you know, um, I should say more particularly in Hindu eyes. But um, this story I'm narrating because it has never been established whether 
the Taliban leadership was a group of people that had sanctioned this stoning. You see, and, and in all of these cases, we have to understand that sometimes local leaders will take things into their hands, which are not act at all authorized by the senior leadership. And one of the reasons why the, the senior Taliban leadership may or may not, may not have authorized perhaps this stoning is because you know, when you're in when you're living at the age of the cell phone, this is precisely the hazard that even the most brutal people are aware of the fact that news of this circulates, a video circulates. It's very difficult to stop people from taking video. You can do it quite surreptitiously. And this is bad publicity. I mean, let us think about how aware the Taliban today are of what kind of publicity they're generating, what kind of images they're generating. A lot of the photographs that you're seeing are in that sense stage photographs, right? So I'm not minimizing what happened remotely, but, but I'm suggesting, and certainly whoever did it, whether it was the Taliban or anyone else, it is a horrific atrocity, right? But whether in fact it was the senior leadership of the Taliban is, whether they were responsible for this is something that we cannot absolutely be certain about, right? Now, it's also important to mention that in the period of the American occupation, they were actually setbacks to women's rights. This is exceedingly important because if the whole justification is going to be that under the American occupation of 20 years, that the rights of women and girls were uniformly advanced, incrementally increased year after year, then that view is in fact actually an incorrect view. It's an incorrect view. And it's an incorrect view because the government of Karzai, in fact, actually passed various pieces of legislation that were detrimental to the rights of women. Right? But I do want to suggest that there is an overt legal infrastructure which protects such rights. Okay, it protects such rights. So 2003 constitutional protection is of women's rights is made available. In 2009, you have the elimination of violence against women law. 27% uh, of 250 seats were reserved for women in the parliament. And apparently this quota was met. It is said that in 2020, so last year, 39% of the 9.5 million students in Afghanistan were women. And the figures that have been released for 2021 suggest that 22% of the workforce was female. This is incidentally equivalent to the um, women's uh, participation in the labor force in India. In India, it's 21.5%, right? Again, keeping in mind the caveat that this is, this does not at all reflect the labor of women in large parts of the rural countryside and all of that, all right? So these are some of the things that have been, have been mentioned, but, um, you know, to suggest that, yeah, you know, that women were, were certainly doing much better overall, despite some of the pushback. And why was there pushback? And this brings me really to the last set of points that I want to really think about. There was pushback because the question has to do with whether there is a fundamental kind of conservatism in Afghanistan which militates against giving rights 
to women and girls. I also want to say that lots of people would like to push this particular discussion into one particular point. And that would be a point that I don't actually necessarily want to engage with because I think we would have to look at a wide spectrum of societies and we would have to entertain all other kinds of considerations. And that is the point that some people uh, have constantly argued, namely that, that in most Muslim societies, there is a hostility to the education of women and girls. I can certainly tell you that that is not the case in Iran. I could give you lots of data to suggest that in fact, that is emphatically not the case in Iran. Uh, I, I could also give data to suggest uh, that when you look at university uh, level education, for example, in most Muslim societies, as is the case in most countries in the world that are not Muslim, there are more women enrolled in universities than are men, all right? And that is actually an unimpeachable fact. And that holds true as I said, for a large, large number of countries, you know, all right? But, but the question here is that if, Afghanis, if Afghans, uh, Afghanistan's society is fundamentally conservative, right? Can certain kinds of reforms be pushed which are against the will of the people? And this is, of course, a question with, with large philosophical, political, ethical implications, and not something that I can really address within the confines of this particular talk. Right? But I would really like to really like to conclude this with reiterating the observation that we have to understand that this has been the principal, what I call veil. And I'm using this metaphor, of course, as a provocation because large part of the discussion, as all of you are aware, when it comes to Afghanistan or when it comes to Muslim societies and the Western press is, and the Western press is it's all about veiling, right? Why do their women have to veil? Um, what are the implications of that? What are the ways in which it constrains them? Right? And then of course the Muslim rejoinder will come that not only do we have to live in conformity to whatever Islam says, but that many women veil out of choice. Uh, you, could, you could give an argument, for example, that one, women, one reason why uh, uh, women veil is because they refuse to be sexualized. So this is what I mean, that this is, it's not gonna be possible to really discuss this within the confines of what I want to do, but I want to suggest that these are some of the considerations that we have to think about. And I think that those who are arguing that we should be uh, extremely fearful about what the reemergence of the Taliban portends for the rights of women and girls, I think that they are right to a very substantial degree. But I think it's going to be important to understand a number of other distinctions which I've not brought into the discussion right now. And that's because, for example, the whole question of the rural urban divide, divide right? That, you know, when we hear about these rights and when we hear about Afghan filmmakers, when we hear about Afghan women journalists, women educators. Well, they're all really largely concentrated in Kabul or in one of the other larger cities. We're not talking about these women being in the countryside. And of course, to say this doesn't mean that this somehow means that, well, this is not a problem for the whole country. That's not what I'm trying to suggest. What I'm trying to suggest rather is that there are certain sectors of that society which are not fully reconciled to the kind of worldview that insists that this is the fundamental way in which we measure 
where a civilization stands in relation to other civilizations. Thank you. <laughs>